Dr. Russ Fray's, uh, who's done a little bit of everything. He was a, a Baptist pastor, got filled with the Holy Spirit, planted a church, lived in the book of Acts for about 10 years, and then moved to Colorado, oversaw a major campus there in the Denver area, then started a Bible institute slash college, was the president of it, and now he runs Joshua Nations, which is an international missions organization that disciples hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. In Cuba, people are being saved and discipled through their ministry. They've prepared stuff for North Korea. As soon as that opens up, they're going to flood North Korea with the gospel and discipleship. Pakistan, Africa, all over the world, his leadership is making a huge impact. And so it's a tremendous blessing to have him as one of our overseers. But also he's going to share with us this morning. So if you would, please welcome Dr. Russ Phrase. Thank you. Good morning, Chapel. Good morning, Chapel. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure you're there. I know my wife is here. She came with me. So, Lana, would you stand up? My wife of 52 years. And, uh, She's the one that makes uh, everything happen. Well, uh, I've been here for about a week in, in pastor study, and it's been so nice and quiet, and all the staff have been so good to take care of me and cater to me, and I'm afraid to go home because other than my wife, I don't get that kind of treatment, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's good to see that, to see this church, to see its operation hand of God upon it and the blessings of the Lord upon it. And uh, we visited a few times over the years, but uh, it's such a great honor to be here uh, with you today. Uh, let's uh, pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, may the Holy Spirit teach us. Oh, God, we need your help to bring this word to these beautiful people. I pray that it, it'll sink in every heart, Lord, as a nail fastened in a sure place. I pray, Lord, that it'll convict and challenge and encourage all of our hearts, oh God, for this day, for this hour we live in. Father, we need you so desperately in our lives, day by day, moment by moment. So bless your people today. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. When I was eight years old, I had a visitation from the Lord, and he asked me this question, will you be a missionary for me? Now, what's an eight-year-old boy going to tell the Lord? And I said, yes. Of course, I was not born again. I was a preacher's kid, not born again. And, uh, but I said, yes, uh, how could I say otherwise? When I was 24 years old in Lafayette, Indiana, in a big green overstuffed chair, I'm reading a newspaper. And it's the end of the year, and the article is talking about nobody had been to see the prisoners in the jail uh, over the holidays. And as I'm sitting there, I'm newly saved, a good Baptist boy, thank God for the Baptists, and uh, 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 all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, although I didn't know it was him, spoke to me and said, I want you to go to the prison and preach to the, uh, uh, the prisoners. And I got up and I looked in the mirror and I looked at myself and uh, myself in the mirror and uh, I didn't know what was going on other than something had just taken place. So I went into the uh, bedroom, I looked in the mirror there, I walked in the kitchen, I come back out in the living room, I looked in the mirror again, and that voice came again, I want you to speak to the men in the prison, in my thoughts, in my spirit, in my process. And uh, so I called my pastor, his name was Jesse James Buell, and uh, I said, Pastor, um, I'm supposed to speak to the men in the prison, what do I do? 
He said, that's amazing. He said, the head deacon was just in my office telling me that we needed to start up the prison ministry again, but we had no preacher, and he said, you're the preacher. <laughs> so that, that call that came to me uh, that afternoon there in that chair was a call to ministry, of course. Everything is determined by the call. Whether you're called to ministry or whether God calls you to do a certain thing wherever you are, everything depends on the call. And when the call comes, and I pray that call will come today to somebody in particular who has not yet been called. And when that call comes, it sets the future, it sets everything, it determines everything. And I pray today that God will call in a new and a special way. Now, there's uh, many calls of God, and we see that in the Bible. They come to many people in many different ways. But we're all called to the Disciples' Commission. The first thing I want to say is you may not be called as I've been called uh, to Africa or the world or the nations we've been to, 96 at this point, but, but we're all called to the Disciples' Commission known as the Great Commission, but everywhere where Jesus issues the call, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the 11. He's talking to those who gathered together with him. And so everybody is called to the Disciples' Commission. Uh, it's God's will for you. You know, the secret to finding God's will in your life is find God's will in the earth, then become a part of it. And God's will is that the world be one. And so Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Jesus said, All power and authority is given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations and, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them everything that I have taught you. And so that was the beginning. And then Jesus again in Mark 16, 15 says, go and preach the gospel to every creature. It doesn't mean hit and miss. It doesn't mean who you want to. It means to every creature. Every creature that comes in, in your locale that you're with, that you don't know, uh, preach the gospel to them and share your faith with them. And that's the disciples' commission. And then, of course, in Mark and Luke 24, 47, Jesus said that this gospel should be preached in all the nations for the forgiveness and remissions of sins. Jesus was a global Jesus. He was a global God, and we're, of course, global Christians. As Pastor was talking about uh, the Iran story and the incredible things that are going on in Iran. Then Jesus, with his disciples, after he met with them, after he was raised from the dead, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And we are the sent ones. We are the apostolos. We are sent to win people. We are sent to nations. We are sent to a community, to a village, to a locale, to your neighbor, whoever it doesn't matter, but we are the sent ones to the lives of people. And so we see that. And then, of course, the great scripture, Acts 1-8, is when Jesus said, uh, as he was teaching them for 40 days, he said, after the Holy Spirit is come upon you, you will be witnesses unto me in Judea, Jerusalem, uh, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, the, the whole globe, every tribe, every, every hut, every person in that hut, we are to make disciples. And Jesus lays it out clearly, and that's our commission, is to the disciples' commission or the great commission. Then Paul comes along and he says in 1 Timothy 4, 5, he says, do the work of of the evangelists. We're not all evangelists, but we're to do the work of the evangelists. That is in our mind, in the back of our mind, ought to be that humanity is lost there without Christ, and we should bring them the good news in every way that we can, all the time that we can. 
So I say, win one and disciple one. Everybody say that. Win one and disciple one. Turn to your neighbor. Win one and disciple one. I don't know of a better thing. After you win one, disciple them and win another and disciple that person and the kingdom of God advances in the world. You see, God's willing. The Holy Spirit is willing. I was uh, sharing with the staff the other day and I talked about putting your way, putting yourself in the way of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus told the disciples when they were sleeping on him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, hey, Peter, wake up, wake up, you know. He says, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is always willing. The spirit is always ready on go. That red light of the Holy Spirit is on go and green. And when we put ourselves in the way of the Holy Spirit, that is allowing him to do what he wants to do in our lives, praying and asking him to do it, then God does his beautiful things. And so be willing. So we're called to the Disciples Commission. Number two, or the secondly, there is the call from above. Now, we read in Acts 9, and we, of course, can't read all of that chapter, but it's the great story of the Saul of Tarsus who's walking or on his donkey. We're not really sure, but he's on the way to Damascus to get more Christians to feed them to the lions and to have them murdered and put in prison and all of those wicked things that Saul of Tarsus did. And on the way, there was a light that shone from heaven. Now, this wasn't the sun. It wasn't a natural light, but it was Jesus himself who exploded on Saul of Tarsus because Jesus is the light of the world. And anytime Jesus gets in a situation, he lights it up. Amen? He, he, he lit up this whole area, and there's this great rabbi laying on his back in the dust of the Damascus turnpike, has no, idea what's, has no idea what's going on, and uh, uh, all of a sudden there's a conversation with Jesus who's been watching. He's been watching what Saul of Tarsus has been doing. And uh, so uh, Saul is laying on his back, and he said, Who are you? And he says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Yeah, aren't you tired of, 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 the, of your conscience goading you, pricking you? Aren't you tired of uh, living in a conscience that has no rest and has no peace? And when a man who's without Christ, his conscience is without rest. It's without peace. There's the, there's the workings of God that's going on inside of him, and that person doesn't know that. And here's the Apostle Paul. There's this, there's this call from above. And he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? That's a wonderful call. That's a question that every one of us, I'm sure you have asked before. But if not, I would encourage you to ask the Lord, what would you have me to do? And uh, uh, here it is. And God, God always gets his man. If you're running from God today, he's going to get you. You can't hide. You can't run fast enough. How can you outrun God? <laughs> you know, unless you're a four-minute miler, and then he'll be there at the finish line waiting for you. You know, you can't outrun God. He has your number. He, he has your mailbox address. He has your phone number. He's God. He knows everything, and you can't outrun God. And here's this great Saul of Tarsus, great rabbi, now he's getting a new rabbi, and Jesus becomes his rabbi. Jesus is my rabbi. Amen. He's my teacher. He's my mentor. Uh, he's our deliverer. He's everything. And so now Paul is making the great exchange, becoming Paul. And uh, Isaiah went through the same situation after Isaiah recognized God in the temple and the coal was put on his lips and, and he confessed and he was made right, God said, uh, uh, who will go for me? Who can I send? 
And Isaiah said, I will go. Will you go? I think that's an answer that Isaiah gave that all of us must reckon with. Will we go across the street, down the road, to the homeless, whoever? Will we go where people need Jesus? And uh, so there's a call from above. Then there's the call from the earth in Acts 16. And this is the story of the Apostle Paul. He's been born again now and been baptized in the Spirit. And now he's a a full-fledged disciple of the Lord and he's working for Jesus now. And so uh, Paul was a preacher And so he's going into Phrygia in Galatia, and the Holy Spirit would not allow him to preach. Now, for a preacher, that's difficult. Amen? Paul was a preacher, man. He was ready to preach everywhere, anywhere, and he did. But now the Holy Spirit forbids him to preach. And so he goes into Mycenae. He's not allowed to preach there. And then he comes to Troas, and while he's sleeping... In the night, he has a vision, and uh, the man of Macedonia stands up and begs, pleads with Paul to come to Macedonia, to come to Europe. And now here is Paul with a a Macedonia moment, and uh, he's going to seize that moment Winston Churchill said, there comes a time in everybody's life, there comes a moment that when that moment comes, when he seizes it, it'll be the greatest moment of his life. You have some great moments in front of you and seize them, grab them, buy up the time, redeem the time and seize that moment and Paul here did Some say the Macedonian man was the angel over that old area. Well, I don't know, but I do know that all of us have a a Macedonia moment. Uh, You have that. Psalms 28, after I got saved 52 years ago and called to preach three days later, as I was reading in the Bible, Psalms 2 and verse 8, The scripture tells us that, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth, the gates of the world for your possession. Think about that. We can have the gates of the world. Could I have an amen? We can have the gates of the world. We can have the nations of the world for our possession. We're just not talking about the the great evangelists and all of the great leaders in America and around the world. You can own the gates of the world. There's a nation in every heart that is sitting here right now. There's a nation. I believe that. There's a nation in every heart. There's a community in every heart. There's an area in every heart right now. And you say, well, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that nation is. How do I find out? Ask him. Ask him. And he will show you. I've been praying that verse for 52 years. I don't know how many times I've prayed it. But over and over and over. And now today... We have Bible training centers in over 60 nations with over almost, almost 8,000 schools with 172 some thousand students and 40,000 graduates. And I will tell you why. It's because I had a Macedonia moment and I took that verse and I prayed that verse and then got in the way of God and the Holy Spirit and he brought it about. And so there's a nation in every heart. (coughs) Who is your Macedonia man? Who is he? Who is she? Who are they? Everybody has 
a Macedonian man. And before you die, you must find that Macedonian man and bring the good news of Jesus to them. I leave you with that challenge today. Now, I'm not through. Don't pack up and get ready to go here. <laughs> but but I, I, I leave you with that challenge today. Who is my Macedonia man? When COVID began, I was praying, and uh, we were all kind of locked in. We were all trying to figure this thing out, what's going out. And, you know, after three days, I found myself piddling around in pools and do nothing. Amen. I mean, finally the Holy Spirit said, hey, listen, uh, I want you to start a neighborhood Bible study. And uh, so I, um, I began to pray about that. And two days later, in my, as I'm walking down my street, uh, uh, I saw one of my neighbors who I'd never met. He was in his garage working on something. And the Holy Spirit said, go, go meet him. Go talk to him. And I went and talked to him. And as we're talking, um, uh, I told him that I'd been a minister for all these years. And he said, oh, we're Christians too. He said, you know, we've wanted to start a Bible school. I mean, a Bible, uh, uh, Bible fellowship in this uh, village that we're in. But we have nobody. And I said, I'm your man. <laughs> Amen. You say to God, I am your man. And then they opened up their house in their area, and uh, we've got a uh, wonderful Bible fellowship going, and we've got all of these elderly people, you know, it's where the dogs walk the people, you know. And, and, uh, and I called my twin brother, and I said, Roy, I said, uh, God told me to start this Bible fellowship group, and they're all old people, and I'm used to just training people and doing whatever else, and I don't know how to talk to them. I don't know how to minister to them. And he said, Russ, you are elderly. <laughs> well, that took care of that, you know. But uh, so we, uh, we began that. And uh, so it wasn't much later when uh, I was having a dream. And uh, it was kind of a sentence dream for me. Uh, just as I'm sleeping, the Lord will show me a sentence. And the Holy Spirit said, give me your best in the next 10 years. I want to encourage you to give him your best in the next 10 years. Give him everything you've got. Eric McManus wrote a book called The Last Arrow, and, and he says, don't leave anything for the world to come. If you got a quiver full of arrows, get rid of them and, and give God your best. How many here will give God his best in the next 10 years? Amen. I won't give an invitation here in a minute, I, you know. Raise your hand. How many say, I'll give him my best? That's all he wants. He just wants your best in, in the next 10 years. And so we're, we're called. Then there's the call from beneath the earth in Luke 16. And this is a sobering call. This is, um, let me get this thing here fixed again. Let me find it. Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> uh, there's the call from beneath the earth. Luke 16, of course, it's the story of the rich man fared sumptuously every day, and the beggar who was Lazarus, who laid at his gate, the dogs came and licked his sores, and he got the crumbs from the table of the people who were eating, and... Um, uh, the scripture says they die, and Lazarus gets an angel escort to the bosom of Abraham, which is kind of a place like heaven, but it's a paradise. It's where the Old Testament saints would go, and indicative of that safe place, waiting for the better place. And it says the rich man was buried and was in hell. How many of y'all know there's a difference? Amen. And how many of y'all know that you want to be like Lazarus and be escorted to heaven and be escorted to the presence of the heavenly father? And I'm sure Abraham's up there now too. 
you know. But uh, anyway, there's, there's this call from beneath the earth. It's, it's a cry. It's a cry from hell. And in, in, in the, the rich man is, is in torment. He's in the worst kind of torment he can be. And he says to Abraham, tell uh, uh, Lazarus to come and just tip the, the, the tip of his finger in some cool water and just put it on my tongue. He was in such torment. He was in hell. As you well know, there is a hell. I'm not a part of the group who's done away with hell. There is a hell. And it's fire, and it's darkness, and it's where the worms do not die. And they'll crawl up your arms, and you'll get rid of them, and they'll come back. You try to squash them, and they'll come back. It's not like a birthday cake where you got candles lit, and you try to blow them out, and you can't blow them out. And the, where the worm dieth not, there's darkness. There's a, there, the soul, individually, a person will be in hell. There'll be no Coors party in hell. There'll be none of your friends that you can find in hell. It's going to be an isolated thing where a person will be who does not accept Jesus Christ and who is not born again. There is a devil's hell, and it's terrible, and it's wicked, and you don't want to go there. Amen? And so to be born again and to receive Jesus Christ is, of course, the key of not going to hell, but there is a hell. And it's waiting for all of those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And he's crying. He's crying from the pits of hell. And, and Abraham says, hey, hey, Lazarus, here's the problem. There's a gulf between us. And, and you can't come over, and Lazarus can't come back, which he wouldn't, but nobody can span that gulf. And as we know, it was the cross of Calvary that fills the gulf between man, good and evil, God and, and bad, and Satan and God. And it was that cross that fit right in there. So through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, we can be born again. And uh, it was through that, and Lazarus is crying, and physically he's separated from God. Emotionally he's separated from God, and, and uh, he's, he's in a strait that uh, I'm glad I'm not going to be there, you know. But there's all kinds of people that are in hell today, this morning, who are crying out saying, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I listen to Grandma? Why didn't I listen to Mama? Why didn't I get born again? Why did I pass my, my chance? And then Lazarus said, Abraham, listen, my brothers are home. Said, let me go. Let me go talk to them. And Abraham said, if they don't listen to the prophets and Moses, that's their opportunity. Today is your opportunity. While you are living is your opportunity. While you have breath in your body is your opportunity. While you can think sanely is your opportunity. All of the ways that God has, has moved in your conscience and you know there's a God and you know you're not living right and you know you need to be born again and you know you need to come to Him. There is a hell. But there's good news for everybody who's born again and for those who today I hope will make that decision. There's a call to go home. There's a call to go home. First Thessalonians says, you know, the, the trumpet is going to blow. And when that trumpet blows, the dead in Christ are going to rise. And then those who are alive will join them to be with the Lord always with him. There's a call to go home. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 said, my departure is at hand. I'm I'm, I'm ready to go. I've fought the fight. I've run the race. I have kept the faith. Therefore, 
there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord himself will give me on that day. Whoa, did you catch that? And not only me, but for everybody else who loves his appearing. You know, it's a, it, it's a beautiful thought. Um, uh, what's going to take place is a marvelous thing. It's a marvelous thing what's going to happen on that day. So the apostle Paul dies and goes to heaven. And Jesus sets that crown on his head. Imagine what it's going to be like when we see Jesus for the first time. Eyeball to eyeball. And you know what's going to happen, sister? He's going to come over to you and... uh, He's going to say to the angel, bring that crown. The angel gets a crown and, no, 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 not that one. That one on the top shelf, that big one that's reserved for this sister. What's your name? Krista. Krista. So the angel's going to come and give that crown to Jesus. and He's going to come and he's going to set that right on your head. Hallelujah. Think about it. When we see him, eyeball to eyeball for the first time. I've seen paintings of him, and so have you, but who knows what is really exactly right. But I tell you, when we see him for the first time, we'll sing that song, It Is Worth It All When I See Jesus. I close with this story. It's about a great missionary, and uh, he served 60 years overseas. Wife died. Two wives died. Children died of disease. He fought all kinds of diseases, all kinds of trials to serve God faithfully. Finally, it's time to go home. So he's on the freighter, he's crossing the Atlantic Ocean, going to dock in New York City. And as they get closer and see the outline of the city, his heart starts beating, he starts getting excited, he's coming home. And he's excited about all those people that are going to meet him. As they pull into the harbor, they can see the bands and the banners, and all the noise. And then they come in, they put the gang plate down. And the brother, the old warrior, thinks, oh boy. And then down the gang plank walks the president. So the president uh, disembarks the ship, and then... The old warrior of the faith is standing there. Yeah, no, he's waiting. He's just waiting. And then he realizes nobody has come to meet him. It's been 60 years, and uh, he's kind of complaining to God, is this what I get for all my labor? The Holy Spirit says to him, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. Hey, beloved, we're not home yet. But I guarantee you, heaven and the angels and the Father and the Lord Jesus will be there waiting. We're not home yet. But one day, we will be. So, I want to challenge you right now. You say, well, Pastor, I'm not really ready. 
I've never really trusted Christ. I'm not living for him. I'm not, I'm not serving him. And uh, I want to give us just a moment, uh, a moment just to, uh, you know, just uh, bow your head and just look in your heart. And you know, I don't know. God knows. You know. Have you ever really said yes to Jesus? Make him the Lord, the Savior of your life. Have you said yes to him? He died on the cross for your sins, shed his blood, gave his life. Now he wants to become your master and your Savior and your Lord. And in that, you're giving yourself to him today and the rest of your life to serve him and to follow him and to become a disciple. Right now, just in the quiet of your heart, hey, Lord Jesus, I realize what you did, and I know you've been raised from the dead, and I know you're the Son of God, and I'm confessing now that I need you. The Scripture says that if you would confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For out of the heart, man believes to righteousness. And with his mouth and his life, he makes confession of that. Do that today. And contact the leaders of this church or however they do it, and pastor will give that information that you made a decision and you want to follow Jesus the rest of your life. Father, I pray for the convicting of the Holy Spirit right now. Oh, Lord Jesus, in this tender moment with these beautiful people, Holy Spirit, right now, just touch here and here and there and there. Squeeze with your convicting power and usher into the arms of the Lord Jesus another soul for the kingdom so we all can go home together. In Jesus' name, amen.